Welcome to Central Study Hour at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. I hope you're doing okay from wherever you're watching and listening listening to us this beautiful Sabbath morning. And I want to greet our congregation as well who are joining us here. And wherever you're watching or listening, we're happy. Have a blessed Sabbath. And we hope that you're ready to join and with singing some hymns this morning. We're going to be singing number 83. Oh, worship the King. We're going to be doing all um, four stanzas. And this is a request from our brother, Jero Apiata, who is writing us from Kenya, all the way from Kenya. So I'm so excited and happy that uh, we have folks who are um, requesting hymns as well all over the world. So let's do this beautiful hymn, Oh, Worship the King. You just have to go to our MEM website to request for a song request. It's www.sexcentral.org. Then contact us just off the menu. And then you're going to select CSH for a hymn request. Make sure you write your name, uh, the number of the hymn, and where are you writing us from? All right. Um, our next and last hymn is going to be 163 at the cross. This is a request from Lene, who's writing us from California. And we're going to be singing all three stanzas, number 163, At the Cross, At the Cross, My Savior. Yes. 
let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're happy all the day because at the cross, at the cross, Father, you save us. Even though we didn't deserve it, Father, you knew, you knew the end and you saw Christ in us. Therefore, we're forever grateful. We want to continue praising and worshiping you for a wonderful and merciful God you are. Bless each listener, whoever is watching us all over the world, and bless this congregation as well as, as we partake the bread, the living bread. Thank you, and Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, for to this morning lesson is going to be lesson number four, how God rescue us. And our speaker is going to be Pastor Fred Dana. Have a beautiful, blessed Sabbath. I want to welcome each of you to Central Study Hour. And um, however you may be viewing us or whether you're right here in the sanctuary, in our church at Sacramento Central, we're glad you are here. Um, our lesson is uh, in the quarterly on Ephesians, uh, lesson four, How God Rescues Us. And um, if you are interested in receiving a CD or DVD of this lesson, uh, call us at 916-457-6511, or you can email us at csh at saccentral.org. And ask for offer C202329. And make sure you specify if you want a CD or DVD and leave us an address so that we can get that to you. All right, so how God rescues us. Look at Sabbath afternoon. The memory text from Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he hath loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And we'll be looking a lot more about what that verse means in the coming pages. But uh, the author picks a, one of the most famous rescue stories uh, in my lifetime, 18-year-old, uh, I mean, 18-month-old baby Jessica. How many of you remember this? When this little girl fell into a well shaft, it was only eight inches wide most people wouldn't be able to fall in something that small, but a, a, a kid that's only a year and a half old could fit in it, barely. And she went flying down in it 22 feet and then jammed and didn't go any farther. She could have gone 100 more feet, if I remember right. So it was very fortunate that she jammed where she did because rescue might have been impossible before she, why she was still alive if it was much deeper. Um, but the media got the story and the whole world was watching this baby Jessica uh, uh, episode. Uh, she would sleep. She actually was sleeping down there sometimes, probably just so tired. And she was crying sometimes. Sometimes she even was heard singing. Imagine that. Only a year and a half old in a situation like that would actually sing a little bit. And of course, many times she would call for her mother and she was down there 58 hours, 58 hours. That's close to a day and a, two days and a half, right? Uh, 58 hours and the worldwide audience watched as Jessica was released from the eight inch well casing that had trapped her. It was the story of the week all across America and other nations in the world. That was back in 1987. I remember it well. And so as the author points out, there's nothing quite as gripping as a rescue story. And in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the author tells us that Paul gives us an up close and personal view of the grandest, most sweeping rescue mission of all times, God's effort to redeem humanity. Except in this story, we're not just hearing about it as distant witnesses we are witnesses to experiencing it. Amen. At least we should be. Amen. All right, so let's go to Sunday's lesson, Once Dead and Deceived by Satan. And the author wants us to go through the first, well, the whole passage of the lesson. It's only 10 verses. And I would like to do it. Um, and he wants us to discover what the main idea that Paul is giving us here about what Jesus has done for us. 
Now, I like to use the expression, the big idea. It's a favorite expression of mine because, you know, there's two different ways to study the Bible. And we should do both. It's not one is definitely better than the other. And theologians have big words for these two different ways. One of them they call biblical theology. And the other one they call systematic theology. Our Bible study guides are an example of simple systematic theology. Systematic theology is when you study a subject, you find all the verses in all the different places that um, here or there a little compare scripture with scripture. That's systematic theology. Okay? And then you take all the, sub, all the verses on a subject, put it together as a study. But if you only study that way, that would not be enough. Because when you study with systematic theology, you don't naturally the way it's done, there's not enough attention paid to context. And so biblical theology is when you read the Bible, when you read an epistle as an epistle, as a letter, you work your way through it and you pay a lot of attention to context. And so when the author says, what's the main idea or what's the big idea of the passage, that is biblical theology. And it's how you read contextually. You cannot read contextually if you don't read this way. And so, you know, I've, I've mentioned this in the past that some books of the Bible are pretty easy to read. With. You don't, you don't, the context is natural, like when you're reading a story. When you read Old Testament stories, like in Genesis, the context is obvious. You don't have to think hard about context. But when you read an epistle by Paul, which is so easy to not realize what he's saying, you know, more than half the time, you cannot just read and automatically know the context because how can you know the context if you don't even know what he's saying? All right. And so when the author says, read through the verses to get the main idea, this is the first step to contextual reading. So you read in context. And so we're going to go through these 10 verses. And when we're done with the 10 verses, I'm going to say, okay, what was the main idea? The main idea has to incorporate all 10 verses. When I taught academy, I used to give kids exercise on this. I would give them a multiple choice question. I'd have them read, like, say, 1 Corinthians 13 or, uh, say, a chapter in the book of James. And I would give them four choices of what the big idea was. And I would always take something really significant in one or two verses and put that there as, as the big idea, which it isn't because it's, it's a key idea of a couple verses, but not the whole passage. And... See, the, the reason why it's so important to get the big idea, and I can tell you, I've seen this so many times. Um, a well-known individual wrote a, a set of Bible studies on one of Paul's epistles. And he did not use the big idea concept. He probably never heard of it before. Um, but in his questions and answers working through a chapter, um, he asked a question about a certain verse. And the question forced you to read that verse out of context. And I thought, why does he stick to the context here? Because the author had a pet idea and thought this was a great place to bring it out. And let me tell you something. That's the natural way to read the Bible if you don't know better. You come to a verse that hits you and you major in that verse and a couple of verses before, you don't even know what that means. But, you know, we, we got this verse. But if you don't know what that other verse means, how do you know the verses you're at? You're not missing something important in the train of thought that Paul is using. You see, so the big idea is super important to reading the Bible contextually. And it's most important in Paul's epistles of any of them. And the reason is because Paul is more complicated than any other Bible writers. All right? And the truth of the matter is, Every disagreement in theology in the Christian church is usually based on Paul's writings. And it's usually based on Romans more than anywhere else. And so we're all experts on Romans and nobody agrees. Well, there's a problem, right? All right. So anyway, uh, I probably shouldn't have spent so much time on that. But this is something I'm passionate about. You got to get the big idea. And all right. So let's go through Roman. I mean, Ephesians. Okay. Yeah, I got to remember we're in Ephesians chapter two. And we're going to read verses 1 through 10 and think about what the big idea is. Now, the big idea has to incorporate every verse. Can't just be something that hits you really powerfully in one verse. Okay. All right. So let's do it. 
Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hmm, what does that mean? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that ye should walk in them. Amen. All right, so when you take all those verses together, what's the big idea? All right. Pam said we were lost and he saved us. Actually, if you look at the title of the lesson, the title of the lesson is the big idea. How God rescues us. I would just like to fill it, flesh it out a little bit because I would say because the last part mentions God's grace. And the first part is about the control of sin in our lives. I'd say when I straight the big idea, I want it to have a more complete sound. It says God's grace has rescued us from the control of sin and given us a new life. Amen. Okay, it takes in everything. All right. And that's what, why it's lesson four is how God rescues us. Now, in chapter one, Paul already talked a little bit about God rescuing us, you know, the salvation. But in chapter two, um, he, he's going to go into more detail on their conversion story and with maybe a more personal focus. So the author puts it this way. He contrasts their past sinful existence, that was verses 1 to 3, with the blessings of God's salvation, which he portrays as a participation in the resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Christ. And he celebrates the basis of that salvation and grace and the created work of God. So that's the author's summary of the 10 verses. All right. And then he says that verse 5 kind of sums up the whole passage. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, See, that's the pre-conversion. He hath quickened us together with Christ. That's the new life. And it's all by grace. By grace you are saved. Amen. So three key points. So well, what does it mean to be dead in trespasses and sins? That's what the first verse says. You, were, you who he has quickened were, were past dead in trespasses and sins. Um, the teacher's comment had some interesting thoughts on being dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, he said there's three possible meanings and well when he says three possible meanings he actually says all three are true um, like the first meaning if you're dead in trespasses and sins he says this could be understood literally because the wages of sin is death if you're dead in trespasses and sins all you have for your future is death okay all right. But we know that Paul's looking at more than that, even though that would be included. Uh, the second thing would be um, being dead in trespasses and sins. He explains it himself. So in verse two, he says, you were dead in trespasses and sin. And then verse two, swears in time, where in, in time past, he walked according to the course of this world. So walking according to the course of this world is to be dead in trespasses and sin. The course of this world or the influence of this world is to call darkness light and light darkness. Uh, to call evil good and good evil. It getting it all mixed up. It, so there's an evil influence in the world. And that's, he said, you followed the course of the world. That's why that was being dead in trespass and sins. But there's a third meaning, and that is in, our, in, our, in their natural state as fallen human beings. They were utterly unable to overcome the gravitational pull of the black hole of sin. In other words, sin 
had become a pervasive controlling force in their very beings. And Paul describes it in verse uh, chapter Romans 7 as becoming another law waging war against us, the law of sin and death. And human nature um, was affected, diseased with an irredeemable uh, contagion. Um, and then in Romans 7, Paul calls it this body of death. Who can deliver me from this body of death? So being dead in trespasses and sins, it takes in quite a bit. It means basically if there's no intervention, yeah, there's no hope, you know. All right, so let's, um, let's look a little more at what the author says, the middle paragraph of the page. In Ephesians 2, 1, 1 and 2, he describes it as a sad reality of their pre-conversion existence, you know, of his uh, audience in, in Ephesus, by no, noting they were spiritually dead, practicing trespasses and sins. In other words, they were dominated by Satan. And he says the ones dead, they were once dead in a metaphorical sense. You know, we could say, well, a spiritual sense, you know, um, separated from God, the source of life. So then he says, well, there's two basic problems there, external problems, things that are outside of the person working against them. One of them was the um, course of the world. He says, you followed the course of the world. You were under the influence of, the, of evil in the world. And that's an external force. You know, the, you know, the customs and the behaviors in the wider society of Ephesus had misshaped human life into rebellion against God. That's what he's saying. That's an external force. But then the other external force is one that maybe we're more familiar with referring to, and that is Satan himself. Satan dominated their prior existence. Uh, he's, in verse um, 2, said, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the children of disobedience. So there's two external forces that were creating this hopeless situation, the course of the world and the prince of the air dominating their lives, just controlling them like puppets on a string. All right, and, and of course he's called the prince of the power of the air, but he's also active on earth. He's the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, as Paul put it. All right, so look at uh, the question at the bottom. It says, what do these verses teach us about the reality of the great controversy? <laughs> Is a great controversy just a theory? No, it's a war. And evil is real. And the enemy is real. It's not a game, right? This, is, this comes out clear in these verses. But then the author asks this question. At the same time, how can we draw comfort and hope in the knowledge that Jesus has been victorious and that we can share in his victory now? I would say that's our only hope, isn't it? Amen. Praise God for Jesus. All right, let's go to Sunday's page. I mean, Monday, excuse me. Monday, once deluded by our own desires. All right, so he's going to go a little farther here because, you know, obviously... Paul sees that without the intervention of God, human existence is dominated by those two external forces I mentioned, the evil world and the prince of evil, Satan. But in Ephesians 2, 3, it brings out an internal force working against us, and that's in the verse. So let's read the verse up above. All of us also lived among them, disobedient at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Let's read it from the King James. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. By the way, the New King James says our conduct because the word translated conversation would be better translated everything we do, everything we say and do, our conduct. Among whom we also had our conduct in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. All right, so what's the internal force? The external forces that make our, make our case hopeless without Christ is the inf evil influence of the world, the direct uh, efforts to control us by the devil, and what's the internal force? The internal force 
here is yielding to our own fallen nature. Yeah. Um, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. So the author goes on to say this. Look at the narrative. It says, the present reality of a lost life is distressing enough. But its last day implications are more frightening still. Human beings, being by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, stand under the threat of God's judgment at the end of time. Hmm. When you think about God's judgment at the end of time, what Bible passage comes to your mind? The most frightening passage in all of Scripture, in Revelation. Yeah, it's the warning not to get to the mark of the beast in the third angel's message. And, and, and when you read that warning, it sounds like the most severe warning in all of the Bible. Many people believe it is. And, um, you know, and they're always surprised. It's in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. <laughs> all right. So there's an end time context to the wrath of God is what the author is bringing out. It isn't just that we can go peacefully to our grave. If we are in the end of time, we're either going to be on Satan's side or we're going to be enemies I mean, we're either going to be on God's side or we're going to be on Satan's side. It will be enemies of God and enemies of God's people. And those people who will try to exterminate God's people will receive wrath from God that has an end time context to it. That's kind of scary. Yeah. So the author says that the phrase by nature, children of wrath, points to another daunting reality. And that reality is this. There is something deeply awry in all of us, right? So if you go down a few lines, you see where it says, we do not just contend. All right, so here's an important point. We do not just contend with sins, but with sin. We are bent toward rebellion against God and toward self-destruction. Humans by default are caught in a pattern of self-destructive sinful behavior following the dictates of Satan. That's what we just read in Ephesians 2, 2. And three, and our own innate sinful desires, verse three, believers once were by nature the children of wrath. So this is interesting. Who is Paul writing this to? He's writing it to believers in Ephesians and he's talking about their past. Now it's important to note that Paul is talking in past tense. They were by nature the children of wrath. Does that mean there's no problem anymore? <laughs> Does that fallen nature automatically go away when we become a Christian? No, it doesn't. So he says, this does not mean that an inherent bent toward evil is no longer reality for believers. All right. I know. And you know that if we don't tune in to Christ, that old nature can kind of slip in in little compromises. And sometimes they become big ones. And so we know the pull is still there, but does it have to control us? No. So the author says, Paul spends a considerable portion of his letter warning that sinful acts rooted in a sinful nature remain a threat for Christians. It does not mean, though, that this old self need no longer dominate. Oh, it does mean, excuse me. It does mean though, that this old self need no longer dominate the believer who through the power of Christ can put off your old self and put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. And that's from Ephesians four, by the way, that passage in Ephesians four is one of my, one of the verses that I like to go to. All right. But that's in chapter four. You need more context before you get there, right? But he's, he's bringing that in here to show the positive that comes. The old self is supposed to be put off so a new self can be on. All right, so question at the bottom. Who hasn't experienced just how corrupted our, our own nature is even after we've given ourselves to Jesus? See, we all know that you give yourself to Jesus, but if you try to live a day without him, it fall, you'll fall pretty fast, you know? That impatience will come out of you. Selfishness will show in ways. And you could be coasting and not even see it until something bigger happens and say, oh, what did I do that for? And then you look back and say, oh, I've been trending this way. You know, so you can't live a minute without Jesus. Amen. You can't. Because he is the source of strength 
to subdue that sinful nature. All right, so who hasn't experienced that? I mean, what, what should this teach us about how important it is that we cling to him every moment of our lives? I mean, why did Jesus say, without me, you can do nothing? Because we absolutely can't. You know, and in that, when Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, he was talking about him being the vine or the main trunk of the, of the vine. And we are the branches. And after all, a branch um, without a connection to the vine can't grow fruit. Can't grow fruit. The Christian life doesn't exist unless the branch is connected to the vine. That's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. He said that after he said, abide in me like a branch to the vine. Because without me, you can do nothing. Because you know, if a branch gets broken off, the life force is broken. The sap that comes up through can't go through. Fruit can't grow. It doesn't matter what else you do to that branch to try to get fruit to grow. If the connection is broken, it will not happen. And that's the Christian life. We cannot have the fruit of a Christian life, the fruit of the Spirit, without that vital connection. Right? So, so here in Steps of Christ, Ellen White wrote this talking about after Adam's sin, he could no longer find joy in holiness. It didn't even appeal to him anymore. And he sought to hide himself from the presence of God. You know, you think about that. What was the first thing man did when he sinned? Tried to get away from God. And that's the way it always is. All right, still, oh, no, such is still the condition of the unrenewed heart. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy in communion with him. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter heaven? It would have no joy for him. You think about it. A lot of people think they can live a sinful life and just hope they go to heaven. If you want to live an open sinful life, you won't want to be there. That's what you'd, people don't understand. It would not be a place where you would be happy. All right. So the sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter heaven? It would have no joy for him. The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love would touch no answering cord in his soul. His thoughts, his interests, his motives would be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. He would be a discordant note in the melody of heaven. Heaven would be to him a place of torture. He would long to be hidden from him who who is its light and center of joy. And she says this, it is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for its companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. All right, so that's, um, you know, Paul dealing with the fact that they are walking according to the course of the world under the power of the prince of the air and following, uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. If that's your life, why would you want to be in heaven? You wouldn't. All right. And then um, the other one I wanted to share, this is the one that um, kind of goes with the whole idea of a branch that's not connected to the main vine cannot produce fruit says this, this is Steps Christ, page 18, same page where the other one ended. It says, it is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort all have their proper sphere. You know, when we want our kids to get a good education, um, we want them to be cultured and refined. And we want them to learn to exercise their will, to have self-control and to put good, you know, great effort into getting good grades and accomplish great things. These are all good things. So she says, education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere. But here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. So parents, don't be satisfied if your children become model citizens and have an outward correctness of behavior, if their heart isn't right. It says they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above. 
before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it, attract it to God, to holiness. Those are pretty clear, aren't they? All right, let's go to Tuesday's page. Uh, now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. So let's read verse 4. Okay, see, this is, this is amazing because those first three verses, Paul's talking about what hopeless wretches they all were. He's not saying that they, weren't, that they were all criminals. He's not saying that they weren't good citizens. He's saying you were just self-centered and you lived for yourself and it came out in various ways. You may not have gotten in trouble in society because you blended in with wicked society. All right? But he's saying that's what it was. And then verse four says, but God, Amen. two powerful words, but God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Amen. All right. So God, um, God intervened. And so the author says, Paul pivots from his doleful portrait of the past lives of his audience to the new hope filled realities that mark their lives as believers. All right, now he's going to ask another question and then we're going to read verses five to seven. It says, in what sense do believers participate in Christ's resurrection, ascension, and ex exaltation? That's the name of this page, right? Now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. In what sense is that true? So let's look at verse five, six, and seven. So verse five, Paul says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. All right. So the question is, in what sense do believers participate in Christ's resurrection, ascension and exaltation? And I'm going to have to ask you to go to Romans 6. Because Romans 6 is a parallel passage to what we're reading here. Because, you know, when he said we were dead in sins, but quickened us together with Christ and raised up together. He's saying the same thing that Paul is saying in Romans 6. Let's look at that. In Romans 6. Well, let me just um, let me just say it and then we'll, we'll look at those verses more closely in a minute. But you see, in Romans 6, Paul's talking about baptism into Christ's death. All right. And being raised in, in Christ's resurrection to new, newness of life. So if we go to Romans 6 and look at verse 4. He says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this. That our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So he's talking about two different kinds of death. So in, in Ephesians, when he says, you were dead in sins, he says, you were dead in sins, meaning sin ruled your life. But in, in Romans 4, he says, but you die in the likeness of Christ's death. You're crucified with Christ. You die to all that. And then in, in Ephesians 2, he says, then you're quickened together with Christ or you're, you get newness of life and the likeness of his resurrection. All right. Now I'm going to go to teacher's comments. There's a um, really good one. So what he said, what the, whoever wrote the teacher's comments said, that um, it is for this very reason that Paul notes that only a resurrection can save us from being dead in sins. Do you get that? If you're dead in sins, do you need a resurrection? You need a spiritual resurrection, right? Paul is saying that's the only thing that you can, you can have hope in. So we, because we do not have in us any intrinsic power to revive, we can't revive ourselves. Only God who created us can recreate us or resurrect us. So the author of the teacher's comment says, Paul's notion of resurrection is a total escape from the damaging power of the world and from the domination of sin. 
It's another kind or an, a new quality of life, eternal life. This unique power of renewal is manifested in Christ's resurrection from the dead and then given to us in the sense that God invited us to share and partake through the Spirit in Christ's resurrection. Amen. All right, so, and then the author of the comments refers to the passage in Romans that we just looked at. It says, in his epistle to the Romans, Paul explains that because sin is such a pervasive force in us, it is inevitable that we die. But because of God's grace, we do not need to die in sin, but to sin. Amen. Very important difference there, right? Christ died in our place for our sin. Now in Christ, we die, but we die with Christ to sin. Paul then concludes that because we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self, the old nature, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is freed from sin. It's a powerful passage. All right, where did I leave off? What page are we on? Tuesday, right? Okay. So then the author says um, that believers themselves participate in an important salvation history events that center on the Messiah, Jesus. So Jesus died and went and um, was put in a tomb. We died of sin and are crucified with him. Jesus was resurrected to new life. We receive new life through Jesus, right? And so the very key events of Jesus' acts in salvation history, we're invited to be a part of in a spiritual sense. So the author says believers are co-resurrected with Christ, co-raised up with Christ, and co-seated with Christ in heavenly places, meaning that believers participate in Christ's seating on the throne of the cosmos. They are co-exalted with Jesus. And that one's kind of hard to comprehend. I, I look and say, God, why would you want me there? <laughs> he says, well, I don't want you there how you are. I want you to let me finish changing you. All right, so... Um, Let's go down to the last five or four lines in the narrative. That we are co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-exalted with Jesus opens up a whole new array of possibilities for us. We have the right to turn from a demon-dominated existence to a life of spiritual abundance and power in Christ. Amen? All right, let's go to Wednesday. Wednesday is called Now Blessed Forever by Grace. All right, so... The author wants us to compare Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 with Ephesians 2, 7. All right, so let's, let's look at that. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Um, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we see here that... God wants to give us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. He wants us to be holy and without blame. And then let's go to chapter 2, verse 7. It says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So the question is, what are the essential elements and goals of God's plan of salvation? Well, first we saw... An essential element or goal in the plan of salvation is God wants to give us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. That we should be holy without blame. And then verse 7 says that in the ages to come, all can continuously see the exceeding riches of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Amen. And then the author says that this brings out a profound truth. If we need to keep seeing God's grace for eternity, do we ever graduate from the school of grace? Do you ever finish your PhD in grace? No, you never finish it. There's no graduation. It's a life that goes on forever in the grace of God. I just like that. So God's plan does not end with a grace-filled past and a mercy-bathed present. God's plan, rooted in divine counsels and time immemorial, stretches forever into the future and includes all the coming ages. I like that. The, the principle of grace shows in the coming ages and God looks forward to demonstrating the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Powerful. Now, there's a, a great um, quotation here from Desire of Ages, last paragraph. Thinking about 
the grace of God being revealed through eternity, we have this really powerful quote. It says, by coming to dwell, by coming to dwell with us, you know, in the first coming of Jesus, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. Do you think the angels are more interested in it than we are? Yeah, we should be even more interested because we're the recipients of it, right? But this describes angels like they're much more excited about studying it than humans are. Uh, the angels desire to look into this whole redeeming love and it will be their study throughout endless ages. They don't get tired of it. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. Powerful. It kind of tells me I need to appreciate this and value it more now. You know, we need, we need help with this, right? All right, let's go to Thursday. Now saved by God. All right, so now he says, read back through Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, focusing on Paul's conclusion in verses 8 through 10. What point does he highlight as he, as he concludes the passage? Let's go through this. You know, we read it once before without a lot of thought. Now let's read it and let everything that's come out sink in. Paul says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conduct in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, are you saved? He's like excited here. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's just everything we've covered. Now let's look and see how he concludes. Verse eight, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto God works, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the question in the quarterly is, what points does he highlight as he concludes the passage? Well, he, isn't he saying that it's all a gift through God's grace? Nothing from mankind could make it happen. And God works in us. His plan, which shows in our life actions. And when it says we've been ordained to good works, that means that the word to translate ordained could mean beforehand, beforehand, before we were even born, God planned the good works, the good life he wanted us to have. He always intended us to have a life abundant in acts of love and mercy, like himself. And so all this comes by grace, but it shows in life actions. All right, so let's look at the first paragraph of the narrative. The, this is the author speaking here. It says, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, Paul documents that the salvation of the believers in Ephesus does not occur because of their good behavior or winsome qualities. It's not like God looked down and said, you know, you're a little better than most. I think I'm going to work with you. When I was a kid, I kind of thought it was that way. <laughs> Had to learn. When the story begins, though, they are spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, right? There's not a spark of life or worth in them. They have been utterly conquered by sin. They exhibit no personal initiative, but are led around by Satan himself and by their own base passions and mental delusions. In fact, in Romans 3, Paul says that there's not one who seeks God. None of us ever sought God before he sought us. No human being since Adam fell has ever sought God on their own. Every good desire you have ever had in your life is proof that God is already intervening. Even the people who don't know him, he's intervening. 
He's, he gives them good desires to do good things, to be kind to people, to help people. It's all the intervention of God. Nothing comes any other way than by, by God's grace. At least nothing good. And then the next paragraph, the author says, but actually it's far worse than that, than simply being without spiritual life or virtue. It says, in company with all mankind, they are the enemies of the true God and are moving toward a day of destiny and divine judgment. They are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So the author says, it's worse than just being dead in trespasses and sins. We're actually God's enemy. But praise God, Paul said in Romans 5, 8, even while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we did anything that made him think he needed to. He did it because he loved us, even though we're, yeah, messed up. All right, so then the author continues. Instead of being rooted in their own qualities, their salvation is rooted in God's inexplicable love. In mercy and love, God acts on their behalf in Christ Jesus, resurrecting them from spiritual death. Because of God's intervention, they experience an amazing itinerary that follows the trajectory of Jesus himself. Remember, we follow in the likeness of his death, the likeness of his resurrection, and in the likeness of his ascension to heaven because we're spiritually to be with him in high heavenly places. It says, from the extreme depth of utter spiritual death and grinding slavery, they are resurrected and conveyed to the heavenly places and seated with Christ on the cosmic throne. Last sentence in that paragraph says, God intends to exhibit his grace toward them in Christ Jesus throughout all eternity. That's what we looked at. So the point Paul keeps trying to make is the salvation of believers is a divine work, not a human one. It does not originate in us, but, it, but in God's gift. No human being can boast of having sparked it. Standing in the grace of God, we believers are exhibits of his grace and only of his grace. We are as masterpieces created by God in Christ Jesus. Now we have an important question at the bottom of this page. Why is it so important for us to understand that our salvation from God is not rooted in our own worth or effort? Well, listen, because new life in Christ or conversion is only possible when the old self dies. Now I've said this many times. Jesus said we have to be born again or we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How can you be born again if you're still in your old nature? The old nature must die to make way for a new birth. And so new life in Christ or conversion is only possible when the old self dies. If we think our old self can spark any goodness at all, we will put confidence in that old self and the old self will not die. And it will prevent us from being converted. Any confidence we have in ourselves becomes a barrier that blocks the way to true conversion. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 9, actually, right at the end of Romans 9, beginning of Romans 10, he talks about how the Jews did not receive the righteousness which comes from God because they were establishing their own. When you think you have something of your own, you hang on to that. And then God can't give you his. All right, now on Friday, there's a couple of really important questions. Um, question number two on discussion questions. Why do you think it is that Paul so frequently recalls the sinful past of his audience, inviting them to reflect on their pre-conversion lives? Is he just trying to make them feel bad? Yeah, you guys, you guys were wretches, and then I came along and helped you out. Is that what he's doing? Not at all. All right, so, but why does he dwell on it sometimes? with how they were sons of disobedience, you know, heirs of the wrath of God. Is he, isn't he just trying to keep a perspective that the old self cannot be righteous and to help the believer to continue to be dead to the old self and clinging to Jesus for the new life in Christ? You know, even if you have a, a real conversion experience, if you start to get cocky in it, like your life is doing better, if you start thinking something's from you, you're going to lose everything. All right, let's go down to question number four. Question number four. While the good works of the believers play no role in their redemption, that is, and that they can never give people saving merit before God, what important part do they play in God's plans for the believer? Okay, so he says it's all by grace, not of works as any man should boast. But then he said, but you're God's workmanship created 
unto Jesus for good works, which God hath before ordained, that you should walk in them. All right, so the question is, what important part do good works play in God's plan for believers? All right, she said, used by the Spirit, he will direct our words, our works. works. Okay. All right, so if it's God's plan, if it's his workmanship that we were ordained to do good works, that means rather than us earning any credit, which we don't, because actually, who, where do the good works come from? They only come from the power of God. Here's the thing. What good works do is they reveal the power of God to change a life. And, and they, they also reveal Jesus living out his life in the person. And this is what's called sanctification. And it does have a place in our redemption, not as merit, but as true obedience that shows that faith and dependence on the grace of God, a life lived in Christ. Amen. It's powerful. Ah, ran out of time. I was going to, there was some good stuff from the teacher's comments, but... Anyway, uh, that, we have to conclude it there. It's, it's an okay place to conclude it, I guess. Um, again, if you're interested in receiving a CD or DVD of this lesson, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sackcentral.org and ask for offer C202329. And make sure you let us know if you want a CD or a DVD and leave an address. And I want to thank each of you for joining us today. May God bless you and guide you.